Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Julie. I'm a woman in long-term recovery. Welcome to medication in Oxford houses. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, please turn off all cell phones during the breakout session, please. Um, and if, if you've got the app on your phone, just remember to rate all the sessions um, as you attend them, please. Okay. So, um, just going to read this little blurb. About half the residents of Oxford House have a physical or mental disorder that requires medications to control. This panel will discuss medicines that fit within an Oxford House environment and those that undermine the alcohol and drug-free foundation of Oxford House living. Just a note that um, medication-assisted treatment and recovery and overdose medication will be covered in a panel in the next set of breakout sessions, so they'll go more in depth um, at 9.45 in a different session about that. Um, some medicines are not permitted because they may be illicit or cause mood-changing behavior and be addictive. On the other hand, some medicines are correctly prescribed and may be necessary for controlling serious mental illness or making a transition from addictive use to comfortable sobriety. This panel will consider how such situations are handled and steps taken by Oxford houses to guard against the misuse of legitimate medication and how to use lockboxes to avoid easy access to the medication. There will be time for Q&A at the end. Um, this panel consists of medical experts and Oxford House alumni um, that are very experienced in dealing with these issues in the houses, so I think we're gonna be in for a treat. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Ken Hoffman. Um, he's an Oxford House board member, and he was instrumental in helping Oxford Houses obtain our recognition for a national best practice. So, welcome, Dr. Hoffman. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, first question I think every year I've asked is, is um, in the, people in this room, how many people have been in formal treatment for addiction? So that's really um, most, but not everybody. And uh, the next question is for those uh, who have come across the medical field, how many people have actually come across providers who you thought really understood addiction? And a far fewer number, I would say maybe a quarter or less, you know, would seem to be raising their hands on that one. So, and that's consistent with the amount of training people seem to get in medical school and things like that. Now, the, the, the other, this is for today, um, you know, fun fact, does anyone know where the word addiction comes from? I'll just, uh, I, I like the definition. It's, it's a Latin word, addictus. And the definition is a debt slave, a person who has been bound as a slave to his creditor. So I thought that kind of hit home when I read that. And the myth of addictus it was, as a, in, in that period is a slave who is freed by his master, you know, unlock the chains, and doesn't realize he's been released, or, or acts as though he hasn't been released. He walks around still with the chains on. So that's the myth of addictus. So I think as one, um, you know, with the, with the research talks and things yesterday, I, I think, you know, it's, it's good to talk a little bit about addiction and the brain and medications in Oxford House, and that's what I thought I'd start off with. First off, um, from it, the, the problem, I think, with, with, with research, as you get into research, is that you start off with a general knowledge of things, and you get more and more specialized, and so the research is very focused on a very specific question in a very specific area, and the answers will be very precise to that specific research question. What's that all mean? It means that if you try to say, where am I living today in the world around me, a lot of the research doesn't capture that holistic you. Um, but you are who you are. Everyone has a brain, and what is common to any substance that has an addictive quality or any behavior that has like an addicting quality, it, it, it works with a dopamine system, the reward center. And in, in this slide here, um, you see uh, the nucleus accumbens, which is um, labeled up there. And, that's, and, and so drugs that have addicting qualities release a lot of dopamine, I mean maybe five to ten times, two to ten times the amount that you might get released, like the runner's high or eating or sex, the drug is going to do more than that. Now, how does the, what happens with that? 
you know, wrap around to where that hippocampus is, that's where the memory is. That's, 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 where, learn, that, that's, where, that's where the memory of the use is, is being embedded. And the amygdala is the um, area where you're gonna get this conditioning, this response, you know, uh, growing up Pavlovian dogs, you know, do this, get this happens. So, um, and, and then the next step, you know, one, one moves from, you know, I like this stuff to I really, really want it to, and this is like a learning process, and that's all going up to the cerebral cortex there. So that's kind of the circuitry that gets involved with addiction. The other, you know, the bad news a little bit too is that the, the brain will always go to equilibrium. Maybe it's good news. What it'll start to do is, gee, um, I don't need all these dopamine receptors because this uh, it's getting flooded all the time. Why not just, why doesn't it, so naturalistically, they'll be pruned. Basically, they'll be kind of um, you know, cut down. So if I go now to the next one here, um, looking at brain metabolism, heart metabolism. This was uh, Dr. Volkov mentioned yesterday, um, who is the director of, of NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, you know, brilliant, salt, brilliant person. But what she was seeing was the analogy between if someone has a sick heart, you know, you have a, uh, on the uh, bottom left side, I guess it's, uh, yeah, he's still left side. Um, you see kind of what a healthy heart looks like. A lot of metabolism going on. That muscle is really working. Go to the right side, and that heart's been struck by something. This ain't a healthy heart. Now you go to the top. There's your healthy brain with its cortex, you know, its prefrontal, its cortex, you know, also metabolizing. But you go to the right. What that is is a disease. This is a cocaine abuser who's been, uh, who's where the, that equilibrium has taken place. Less dopamine is available to respond, and, and this person obviously is not the same as the person on the left. So. The other part that happens is that the people talk about brains evolving and why drug use early on is probably not a great idea. And in fact, if, if I were a tobacco company, I really want people to start in middle school because the, the, the uh, brain here, the evolution is mostly frontal cortex, mostly cortex, the thinking of the behavioral pieces are evolving fairly significantly, you know, five to age 20 and actually continuing to 26. And it never stops actually, but this is just the most rapid growth. So guess what? The drugs you start using earlier in life that are addicting are much harder to get rid of, to, to, to recover from, than something that's happening a little later in life. You know? but, but it's all being embedded into the circuitry now, this prefrontal cortex, and the response, the learning responses in this prefrontal cortex, which is, the, uh, which is what you're now you know, going to recovery, is how do you reverse that process? So if you will, the good news in some of this, and the bad news, is going to the left, you have a healthy person. Now this, again, focused research, the imagery is done. These are, this is imagery of dopamine receptors um, concentrating in that you know, nucleus accumbens part of the brain. Um, and it's a, meth, a methamphetamine abuser who's been studied. And you go to that middle brain, now they've stopped, and it's one month after stopping. That brain doesn't have a lot of dopamine receptors. And guess what, you know, when you look at, um, you know, how do you think this person feels? Lousy, depressed. Their sleep is crap. You know, they're not they're not concentrating. They're not focusing. You know, it's all you know, and there's really not a lot of medications that's going to fix that. You know, but time will, and and time and what you do every day in recovery will fix that. And so what you have available in the support of an Oxford house are people that yeah I've been through that. You know, it gets better, but it's day by day by day by day, and and without the medication. You have 14 months later, this brain has kind of come back to normal, but it is about four, you know, one to two years. People will talk about four years. So when people talk about post-acute withdrawal syndrome, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, um, cocaine, um, you know, Adderall, um, you know, this is what, th th this is why, if you will, this is a kind of a, an image as to biologically, you know, where this, you know, where this might be coming from. So, you know, I see people on day one, you know, they might be in, um, coming into treatment and, you know, say, everybody comes in depressed, anxious, unable to concentrate, can't sleep, you know, whatever. And I, you, you can medicate all of it day one, and some people are, you know. On the other hand, if you let a little time go by, you know, the dual diagnosis, what also emerges? Okay, if it's there, it will emerge over time, um, and you can treat it then. But in the meantime, you have the support, it really is the support of other people, this, uh, which is not given a lot of credit in a lot of medicine, but you know the value of it because you're living in Oxford houses. Um, so if you go into the, you know, what makes a drug addictive, 
if I really want to release a lot of dopamine, I get the drug in there as fast as I can, and the best way to do it is inhale it. You know, so guess what? You know, there's nicotine, there's crystal meth, there's, uh, you know, snorting. Uh, well, actually, snorting is next best. Um, you know, crack cocaine. If I want to slow it down a little bit, you know, I, you know IV is actually a little slower <laughs> than, than inhaling um, because it, it takes a little longer, a little bit, not much. Uh, and if I really want to slow it down, I, I put it through the belly, basically. And so you've got a lot of medications that are oral medications go through the belly. Um, drug companies will start to slow down the release of it. So you have Vyvanse instead of instant release uh, amphetamine. You know, it's just a, it actually Vyvanse, the drug will convert it to amphetamine so that it can be used as amphetamine. Um, and, uh, you know, you have, it's actually on the reward system. Now, not all people, and this goes for all drugs actually too, react the same way to the same drug. And I'll see that within classes, you know, and you say, try one, try the other. Some people, opiates is, well, this stuff stinks. I, I don't want, it makes me sick, you know, it doesn't really do much for the pain. Another person is, oh, you know. So there's a bit of a genetic predisposition. It's getting studied, you know, but, but, but you know, but, you know, from the hands is raised yesterday, you know, we have the population here that has genetically been predisposed to that pleasurable response to opiates. Um, and as it evolves from the liking to the wanting to the, and to that enslavement, if you will, the enslavement really is that obsessive compulsive loss of control. And if there's any control at all, it's on that first, you know, do I use it now? Once started, it kind of has a little life of its own. That's all the condition responses, the memory, the triggers are all there, you know, so that your five senses are connecting to the social environment and, and to specific things, you know, so that's, that's where your triggers. And if one is in good recovery, the kindling of that can be also pretty rapid. So that's why the vigilance is there. That's the first step, basically. Um, so that's the, uh, and then the physiological factors, increasing amounts to try to get the same effect. That's, you know, the downregulation of that dopamine system. Uh, flip it around, you get withdrawal sickness. So what ends up happening is that you're using just to kind of, how do I stay normal today? But it's not about relationship with anything else other than to get the drug, right? I mean, that's kind of where we're at. So the, um, you know, I call it side effects, but the reality is that there's a, uh, uh, you know, there's a flip side. So what makes a drug useful, and I think that's, uh, I'm probably coming to my five minutes, 10 minutes, um, that I always see that the drug itself, there's a tendency, you know, in medicine, you know, I will cure with this drug, you know, antibiotics, for example, you know, gets rid of the infection. Um, but in most cases, in, in mental health, it's really not an end to itself. You get a few people that, yeah, this thing has a cycle of its own, like the mood goes up, it goes down, or the anxiety is there no matter what. I have good coping skills, I have good friends, I, I'm, doing, I'm planning things well. Okay, I'm resetting the thermostat, if you will, with these drugs. So I'm just kind of changing it a little bit. So instead of going into a state of panic, I can be anxious, but I can, I can have a normal day. You know, I can be depressed, but have a normal day. It's not overwhelming. Um, I'm not craving, I'm not going out to grab drugs because you know, I, I, it's, just not, it, it's just not that intense. So the drugs can modulate that. So whether it's, an S, you know, whether it's like a Prozac-like thing or it's a, um, a abuse bar, or, you know, and, and, this, and, and Suboxone you know, methadone actually can fit into that crowd. I think that was the initial, when it was initially coming onto the market, it, doesn't, it didn't have the same, you know, I don't crave the thing anymore, I can live a normal life. So that's kind of the role of any of the medications. It's not an end to itself, but it should be a catalyst of where you want to be or to help you get to where you want to be, which is sometimes it's kind of starting off where you left, you know, start, starting where you left off before the drug became a problem, but then, oh, well, these were the issues at that time. Well, they might be issues now, but I have other coping skills. I can do other things with it. I have friends that I didn't have before. By the way, people usually start using in groups. You know, I don't know how many people actually started using just all their, on their lonesome. You know, usually there's a group involved. The recovery is also in groups. It's just a different group, hopefully. Well, maybe not if it's the same group. Uh, and, and it should be, you know, so, the, so you're looking at drugs that have low abuse potential with, not just generically, but also with the individual. Um, the relapse risk symptoms are targeted for improvement, so you, 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 um, you know, that, that's, that's where therapy kind of fits into it, whether it's cognitive behavioral, motivational enhancement, 12-step uh, facilitation, um, there's an educational, there's a motivational, and the empowerment at the end of therapy is that you have a new, you have a life that you're comfortable with, and it takes, you know, you do things for a first month or two because it's good for you, but after about six months, you actually, it's the new me, but that's kind of the brain has also evolved in that direction, that's that it is the new you. And maybe it's the old you, but before the drug came in. 
um, it should be prescribed by somebody who understands recovery. And that's where most of you don't seem to, have, yeah, and, and that's kind of, I think, this problem in the field. But if you can find, and, and maybe this is where this network is really good, because any of you who can find a provider that you've actually trusted, you know, maybe that name can get passed on. I don't think we have a list of people that, uh, that truly understand what's going, you know, what, what, what is best in Oxford House and an Oxford House resident, but that's actually important, you know, as, 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 as you see here today. Um, and uh, is, is, um, if it, you know, is available and needed to modulate prescriptions, understand recovery goals and relapse prevention. No medicine needs to be forever, um, but the longer one is on certain medications, the longer it might be useful. So you know, those are decisions that should be individually made, but what's important is that recovery is really the behavior. What you're doing is the important thing, and the medications just should be helping you to get there, and that's where I'll end. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Okay, next we have Paul Stevens. He's an Oxford House alumni and regional outreach manager for Texas. Oh, I'm sorry, Virginia. <laughs> Virginia. Sorry. Love you too. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Talk a little bit about medication in Oxford House. Um, and the intro said you're going to hear from a few medical experts. That's not true. You just heard from the medical expert. The rest of us are just Oxford House outreach and alumni, and none of us are experts in that. We are all certified drug addicts, though. Um, all right, let me see what I got here. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I've been with Oxford House now for 17 years. Um, medication is an issue that has always been one of the biggest challenges for us in the houses. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges for outreach to figure out how to deal with as far as guiding the houses. Um, I don't think that's going to change. Um, so, you know, if you're frustrated because you, this seems to be one of the issues that your house sort of stumbles over a lot and struggles with, it's just kind of part of the deal in Oxford House. It's kind of baked into the model, and I'll kind of talk about that a little more in a second. Um, so I, Dr. Hoffman touched on this briefly, but um, I'll just add, and this is, I've learned this from him, I've learned it from Dr. Gitlow and a few other uh, experts that I've heard here at the World Convention over the years, um, that you know a lot of physicians don't know a lot about addiction. Um, and so, they don't know a lot about us sometimes. <laughs> I'm a little confused about how to deal with us. Uh, and because they're not well informed about addiction, um, they often mistake, they, dual diagnosis gets over-diagnosed. Uh, over so there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of anxiety, depression, uh, sleep issues that are associated with, uh, with, with substance use that then get uh, diagnosed as dual diagnosis for anxiety or depression and people get prescribed things that they don't necessarily need. 90% um, of the cases, Dr. Gitlow talked about this a few years ago, that there was a few studies that sort of led doctors to believe there was a higher prevalence of dual diagnosis, both addiction and other mental health issues, but that they were really kind of flawed in their methodology and that the truth is that probably 90% of dual diagnoses are inaccurate to some degree and that over time it will be shown that like really a lot of those symptoms were associated with the drug use and the addiction. 10% um, of those cases though of course are legitimate and we're not suggesting you know and it's not up to us in the house to figure that out. I'm telling you this because I think it just helps us sort of with our general approach or philosophy about you know what we're expecting to see in people that move into houses and what kind of medications are going to be taking. Um, a lot of times it takes a while, six months, uh, for the anxiety that's associated with active addiction to sort of start to fade away. Uh, it can sometimes take upwards of a year uh, for the sleep issues. So we end up with a lot of overprescribing of psychiatric medications. So I mean, the good news there is that a lot of us who think that we are both addicts and crazy are maybe not. Um, <laughs> the bad news is that uh, we think we are. Many of our healthcare providers think we are, and we all end up overprescribed medications as a result of that. Um, so, you know, there's a certain level maybe of, uh, I don't want to say skepticism about that, uh, 
but just be aware that that happens. I mean, and it happens with, uh, it happens with, what do we got here? Oh, I'm going to skip through this real uh, pretty fast, but it happens with pain medication too. I mean, there was, there's a long story about how we ended up at the point, and I think at this point we've been talking about this for three, four, five years, the uh, prescription, you know, opioid epidemic, um, and how we kind of got there. As a matter of fact, there was a guy talking yesterday that just wrote a book about this, um, how you know, through a process of, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical companies pushing a lot of these drugs and uh, the medical profession starting to look at pain as an objective measure, um, along with other things like blood pressure and hospitals trying to create, like, uh, you know, positive uh, customer experiences. I mean, there was a number of things that went into this, and one of the results was that, you know, lots and lots of pain medication getting overprescribed. Um, let me just... At the same time um, as that, though, and I, this doesn't get talked about as much, but there's been an enormous increase in the prescription of non-opioid uh, uh, drugs like benzodiazepines or um, sedatives like Lunesta, Ambien, things like that have exploded as well. Um, but in Oxford House, well, and I'll also say this, I think to some extent, there is now more of an awareness in the last few years of that, and in a way, you're seeing the pendulum start to swing back to where doctors are actually becoming much more uh, uh, conservative about prescribing those drugs, uh, perhaps almost to the point where they're starting to throw people who are legitimately needing those chronic pain medications under the bus and making it difficult for them to actually kind of deal with their own health issues. Um, but in Oxford House, uh, our philosophy, you know, and I think we just need to remember this, is that we are total abstinence, zero tolerance recovery homes. Um, the model requires that decisions about prescriptions be made by the house. Uh, and I think this speaks to a larger point, uh, which is that, and I talk to outreach workers about this all the time, I talk to houses about it all the time, but I think all of us would think this whole thing about how to run houses would be a lot easier if there was this big 100-page you know, manual of policies and rules and regulations that just spelled out what we needed to do with every situation and every difficult person and every disruptive behavior uh, and every rule violation. And that's just, it doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist on purpose because the whole idea of Oxford House was not to provide you the answer to every situation and problem, but for you all in the house running it yourself, to have to figure out case by case, person by person, situation by situation, what are we going to do here? The context matters. The person you're talking about matters, you know? I mean, you might decide to react to how someone in the house is, you know, behaving that's been there for three years and, you know, has, is sponsoring people and, you know, has, everyone perceives them as having a really good strong foothold in their recovery versus the new guy. Like, you might have the exact same situation and deal with it differently because of who it is, um, so we come here, and I think this is very true with the medication stuff, hoping maybe there's some answers, like I'm going to tell you, like, these are the drugs that are okay and these are the drugs that aren't okay. And we just don't have a policy like that. We really do, and that's really because, like I said, we want you to have to self-govern. We want you to have to engage in the process yourselves. Um, it's also fundamentally because we trust you. Like, we know that addicts know what recovery looks like and what relapse looks like. We believe that you can tell the difference between someone who is legitimately talking about medication they need for some kind of health issue and people that are just dope fiending to try to get drugs to like, you know, feel different. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, cool. I got the poke. <laughs> I'm running out of time. That's good. Um, so yeah, I mean, it really, that's, you know, that sort of overarching theme was the point I really just wanted to make, which is like, we don't have a lot of specific answers and we trust you and you have to make decisions. Um, there are nevertheless some, some drugs that I would say are potentially more problematic that you would be more, uh, uh, you know, more, you know, thinking about whether you're really gonna go with uh, this or not. And there they are. Um, Opioid pain medication, particularly long-term use, could be problematic, might not have a role in Oxford House. Um, 
benzodiazepines, I consider those to be really some of the most challenging and problematic ones because there are other things that people can take for anxiety besides benzodiazepines, and they're highly addictive um, and really problematic. Um, sedatives and hypnotics are a problem too. Um, really fundamentally, a lot of the drugs that we use recreationally out there on, you know, on the street. Um, uh, and then just the last point I will make is, I'm going to skip through a couple of these because the other people are going to talk about some of the nuts and bolts of the procedures about how you deal with medication in the houses. Um, this is Tradition 7, and I just wanted to remind people that this, you know, is one of our fundamental nine traditions, um, and it, you know, talks about how houses can require members to seek professional help if their behavior is disruptive. Within an Oxford House group, it's not unusual to find some members who have problems that cannot be dealt with by the group. In those situations, it's not uncommon for the Oxford House members at a meeting to strongly suggest that a fellow member seek professional help. In those situations where a member's behavior is disruptive to the group as a whole, the member may be required to seek such professional help. And I think this just speaks to the idea that, like, it is our business, the house's business, like what, you know, your health care and what medicines you're on, and the house has to be okay with those. And if you think, if you're not comfortable with that, if you think that the entire conversation about your health and what drugs you're on should be between you and your medical professional and not your family inside of an Oxford house, you sh probably should not live in an Oxford house because it is their business, you know? We're a unique model. There is no, like, staff inside there. It's just us other recovering addicts, and it matters to us what drugs are in the house. We have, uh, we have a right to be part of the conversation about what you're gonna take and what you're not gonna take. All right, I'm done, thanks. Thank you, Paul. Okay, our next um, panelist is Jessica Burden. She's Senior Outreach Coordinator in the state of Indiana. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jessica and I'm a person in long-term recovery and what that means to me is I haven't felt it necessary to use any mind-altering substance since December 31st, 2015. Thank you. Let me point out I'm super nervous. Who would know microphones, a podium, and Broadway lights in a room full of my peers would make me almost throw up. So <laughs> please bear with me. Um, I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about the individual, your responsibility as an individual um, on medication within your houses. Um, the accountability within the individual comes first on filling out your application honestly or making sure the person that is applying is being honest. I always tell my houses, make sure we ask, are you on any kind of medications? Because if we aren't aware when they move in, then we can't do our part with the accountability to make sure we keep our house safe um, and you know we're doing things like we're supposed to do. Um, I think super important is making sure that either ourselves or the people that we live with are taking the medication as prescribed, the way it says on the bottle. If we're taking too much or too little, it's considered a relapse. We don't self-medicate today. If you feel like you need to make some changes with the doses that you're taking, then that needs to be a conversation had with your doctor. You know, I used to self-medicate in active addiction, right? Like, oh, let me just take more, 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 more. Um, I don't think I ever said, let me take less, 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 less. But um, if someone in your house, you know, the behaviors will show if they're taking too much. And I feel like it's our responsibility to say, hey, you know, are you taking too much? Is it, you know, are you okay? Is it making you sleepy? How is the, you know, if they, that they've upped it, if they've brought it down some, you know, checking on that person that you live with, I feel is a huge responsibility. They should make you aware or the house aware that there has been a dose change in their medications. We can't help them if we don't know what to do, if we don't know what they are, what their situation is. Um, also, when we talk about taking medications as a label said, like it says take by mouth. We're not dissolving our Suboxone in a spoon anymore. That is, that's old behavior. The label says take by mouth. We're not gonna crush it up on the dresser. We're not gonna, none of that. Like we need to take it as prescribed. And like we're laughing, but the truth is, is like it happens. You know, I, I, I'm an addict every single day through and through. And if I think that I'm gonna get it, the, 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 I'm gonna, you know, it's gonna affect me quicker or help me quicker, then that's how I'm gonna do it. 
But like what recovery teaches me is to follow direction. And if the label on the bottle says, take it by mouth, then I'm gonna get up, go to the kitchen, get some water and take it by mouth. I won't even chew it up today, right? Like I'm just gonna take it. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's also the individual's responsibility to be proactive about getting medication filled on time. You know, today I know if I'm, if I'm got three pills left and I take three a day, then I need to call it in a couple days early so it can be ready so there's not a lapse. Because I feel like if I have a lapse in my prescription or I'm running out, my mind is going to tell me, ask my roommate, you know, or I'm going to go to the, you know, streets to get medication. And, like, that's old behavior for us. And, and, and the next thing we know, we're trying to do a whole lot of other things to get our medications filled. So, you know, we need to be proactive and pay attention and be aware that if we're gonna run out of our medications, let's get them filled, call them in, make sure we know that they are going to be ready to be picked up by the time our current bottle is out. I think that's it. I'm super fast talker when I'm so nervous. Thank God I've got wonderful <laughs> guys behind me that can make up my time. Um, uh, I think that's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. All right, Sean Johnson's gonna be next. Um, and he is Senior Outreach Coordinator in the state of Texas. And can you pull the last PowerPoint up? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Hey, what's up, Travis? How you doing? Um, yeah, happy to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is the medication memo. Um, does everyone know what the medication memo is by show of hands? If you know what the memo medication, okay, cool. All right, awesome. So I definitely am happy that I'm talking about this. Um, so what the medication memo is, is it's a memo from the main office. I'm not sure when it came out, but it speaks directly to when a resident comes into a house and is on narcotic medication or is living in a house and needs to transition onto narcotic medication. So here's, I'll read it to you. Um, so what the memo says is that um, it's, to all the Oxford House residents from Oxford House Inc. And what it says is, we've had several inquiries to our office as to the policy concerning long-term, which is considered more than two weeks, or permanent use of prescribed narcotics by our residents. Any member prescribed nar narcotics by a physician must have a letter from his or her doctor acknowledging that they are aware that their patient is a recovering alcoholic or drug addict and that in their professional opinion, there is no alternative or suitable non-narcotic pain medication for their condition. The letter should also state the length of time the patient should be on the prescribed medication. In addition, the group conscience of the house must determine if the presence of narcotics in the house might trigger or have a negative effect on their own recovery and vote accordingly, keeping in mind that we are a zero tolerance program. So there's a lot, there's a lot in that. So let's kind of unpack that a little bit. So, um, so the first thing is uh, um, being prescribed narcotics by a doctor. So we need to see this letter so that we can have, so first of all, I wanna say majority of the residents that live in Oxford House are not doctors, um, right? So, I, but I don't know, like I don't know, maybe in some areas mostly doctors live in Oxford Houses. That's why I say majority. I just know in my experience, most of our residents are not doctors. So this is why this, this memo is so important. We wanna hear it from the doctor that the conversation has been had between the resident and the doctor that okay, look, I am in recovery, right? And not only am I in recovery, but I live in an Oxford house, which is like 
Paul said, a zero tolerance, um, abstinence-based program. Um, so I know that this person is in recovery from drug addiction or alcoholism. I know that they live in an, ab an abstinence-based, zero tolerance uh, recovery home. And I still think, as a medical professional, that this is the most appropriate treatment for the causes and conditions that this, this uh, person is experiencing. So uh, we want to hear, we want to see that letter so that we can hear from the, the horse's mouth. And, um, uh, you know, we want, I always like to trust our residents, but when it comes to narcotics, I mean, we can do some things that are not so trustworthy. So this is a, this is a really um, important, important letter. So, um, and, and then it should also state the length of time that this person is going to be on this medication. I know I hear in houses all the time that, um, like we want to, I've actually asked this, like when I first got into Oxford house, there was a guy who came in on Suboxone and I was like, okay, what's your taper program going to be? Like, I'm a doctor, like I'm, I'm going to help you get <laughs> off of this medication because like, this is, you know, like I had my opinions. Um, so we want to hear from the doctor, like what is the plan, uh, what is the, the game plan for, for the, the, um, the applicant and the doctor. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the second paragraph talks about how um, we have to remember that this is, a, this is a group conscience. This is still a democratic household. And if the presence of a narcotic medication is going to make residents feel uncomfortable, um, the democracy still needs to be held in the house. So um, we, need to, we need to, when, when, you know, at, at, when we're doing our delegations after the, the interview, um, it's important that everyone speak their truth and talk about like, what the presence of um, certain medications are going to have on, uh, the effect that they're gonna have on the residents and and vote accordingly. So if it doesn't, if it's it's gonna trigger you, or speak your truth, and and, and let the democratic and the, the group conscience um, uh, make the decision. And um, yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, now we have James Alston, who is Oxford House alumni and outreach in Arizona. Good morning, family. My name is James Alston. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and what that means for me is I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink or a drug since February 26, 2014, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. So why are we even talking about medications in Oxford houses? Um, well, for, the, for us, for, for the house's responsibility, uh, when a person comes in with uh, medication, we need to make sure that we are still providing a safe, supportive environment for the rest of the individuals that are still in the home, right? So when, when Jessica was talking about that, it is the individual's responsibility to be honest in their interview to be honest on the application, it's the house's responsibility to the individual to help them with following through with that recovery plan, right? So we're gonna do some monitoring. So checking the prescription and bottles, checking the prescription and bottles and not just trusting that they're telling us what is on the label is on the label, that we actually get to see it, right? It's not that I don't trust you, I don't trust your disease, right? So we cannot hold or administer the medication. That is their medication. So as a house, we want, if we're helping that individual with taking that medication as prescribed, then it needs to be in their possession because we're teaching responsibility, right? Requiring the member to secure the medication. So I wanna talk about like why Securing medication is important. On, in July 2013, I tried to complete suicide using pills. So the presence of an orange pill bottle or a pill bottle in the house was a trigger for me. And I shared that with the individuals that I lived with, and they, they wanted to help me out. 
So I was like, can, you, can we just kind of keep it out of sight and out of mind? I mean, I didn't know that there was like an official medication policy that said that it needed to be in this da 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 da. The people that I lived with just wanted to help me and wanted me to be safe in the home that I lived in. So requiring lock boxes in a house, albeit it might be a little bit tedious and you know, maybe expensive, but there are some ideas that we can do as a house to be able to ensure that every person is gonna be okay, like myself. We could purchase lock boxes for every bed in the house. And then we can rent out the lock boxes or the keys to the lock box, kind of charge a, a fee that uh, if, if returned, the key is returned, then we can give back, uh, like we can give back that money that it costs to, but making sure that we are, making sure that we are uh, keeping the medications secure in the home so that everyone feels safe in, that, in their Oxford house. That's why we're talking about it. Right, because that's what we're here to do is provide re uh, rehabilitative support for the addict and alcoholic who is still, who wants to stop and stay stopped. So the presence of some medication that might trigger me needs to be secure so I feel safe. So um, some, another uh, individual responsibility that Jessica was saying is that you, as the individual, you need to take your medication as prescribed. Well, why would, why would a house care about that? Well, I can tell you why I cared about that, because I abused pills, right? So the presence of someone else abusing pills was a little bit off-putting for me, because I was trying to live a better life, and that was what I used was, was to you know, harm myself, and I'm trying to live a little bit better today. So you taking your medication as prescribed is gonna help me stay on my track in recovery. So counting the pills is mostly for the individual to help be able, for the house to be able to provide that support for them. So you can do it in, in several different ways. You can have two individuals count the medication um, not where they are holding the medication because we don't hold medications, but they're counting that medication in front of them. And, and if you're uncomfortable, because that's, I was uncomfortable with when uh, it came to medication, but I didn't realize that I uh, needed to work on that and I was denying the fact that I was a, a drug addict and I only considered myself an alcoholic. But my house saw when that when the Klonopin came out on the table, I was the first person ready to go over there and help the individual count their pills. <laughs> <laughs> I was the first person to get over there. And so the, my house was like, maybe, maybe James shouldn't be the one who's over there trying to help <laughs> count the Klonopin. So if, if, it, if it's uncomfortable, then speak up. Speak up in your houses, you do have a voice. So counting the medication is, like I said, just to make sure that the individual is taking it as prescribed and that those behaviors are not going to affect you in your recovery while living in the house. So two other members, usually at a house meeting. Now, if you have a lot of medications, it's going to be a very long house meeting. Um, so some people, some houses have just decided to do it based on behaviors. So knowing the medications that people are on and doing it based on behaviors by recognizing the side effects with our brother who is a little bit off because he's taking his medication incorrectly. So, but there's a difference between misuse and abuse in an Oxford house. So the letter of the law says that if I take all my medications as prescribed, then my blood pressure medication, if it's incorrectly taken, then I need to be considered for the same expulsion that someone else might face if they were to take the medication not as prescribed. There are other medications not as prescribed. So are we living by the letter of the law or are we living by the spirit of the law today? So the spirit of the law is why are we even talking about it? So the medication, if, if we're just kicking people out because of their blood pressure medication is off, then it is not about the blood pressure medication being off, right? We, want, we are finding some other way 
finding some other way to get them out of the house because we don't want to have the conversation about it. Medication accountability is for that reason, is to help the individual get to the next place in their recovery. Not so that we can just kick them out on the street because you know their blood pressure medication was off. So county medications is, we need to kind of keep in mind it's the, uh, wh why we're doing it. All right, misuse and abuse in, in Oxford House is, um, I mean, I, I, I dealt with a situation um, out, in, uh, out in San Angelo when I was out there and I was doing outreach, and the individual was taking his, he was taking his medication-assisted treatment incorrectly, but his doctor had told him he could take one or two more, one or two more, but um, when, he, when he felt it was needed, <laughs> right? So... We didn't, I, I'm not, I wasn't in that doctor's appointment with that individual, but you know what I asked in, his ne in the next house meeting is, can I go with you? Can I go with you to your doctor's appointment? I asked, right? So I went with them, you know, just like a family member would go in with, a, with, with, a, with the person that they're living with and kind of want to be informed about what the real procedures are about that, because again, it's not that I don't trust you, I don't trust your disease. So when, when I found out that the doctor did actually say that, um, I, kept, I was able to come back to the house and let them know, yeah, the doctor did say that. And, they, and the house was getting ready to expel him because he was taking too many, because what, what, was, what was on the label was, uh, what, it was not what he was taking. And this guy ended up getting expelled, unfortunately, um, even though he was doing what his doctor said he was, what, what he was allowed to do. Um, and I had gone out of town, and for some reason, they just decided that they were going to get him out because they did not like the presence of the medication in the home, which started at the interview, right? We all had a voice there but we didn't voice it. So someone ended up being homeless because of that. So misuse and abuse, it all comes down to what? Behaviors, right? Are they intentionally using the medication to get high? Or are they using the medication incorrectly because they've forgot something, forgot to do something? or maybe they just don't know enough about it themselves. So the house has to decide. You have your voice, so use it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, our final panelist is Daryl Joyner, who is an Oxford House alumni, and he works at the central office in Silver Spring. Good morning, family. My name is Daryl. I'm a gentleman in long-term recovery, but that means I haven't found it necessary uh, to pick up a drink or drug since March 18th of 2000. I owe that date to a, a lot of things. Um, one of them is that um, the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous and the rooms of AA have helped me keep my sobriety for the time that I've had. The next thing is um, the medication that I'm on. I'm also a gentleman that has lived with the HIV virus. It'll be 30 years this come November. Yeah. Somehow, some way, I became the face of uh, people living with the HIV virus in, in Oxford houses. And I volunteered for this uh, panel about five years ago. And I thought it was just a one-time thing, but Paul finds it necessary to put me on the panel every year. I don't mind. I don't mind. I don't mind. But um, let me just ask, uh, by a show of hands, who in this audience right now is a clinician? Meaning you're in the medical field. I see one, one hand. I see two. I see four. four. Oh, well, there's Dr. Crescent <laughs> Clark. Okay. <laughs> you do count. <laughs> 
The reason why I ask that is because uh, a majority of us in Oxford Houses are not clinicians. So that when you have a resident that is taking a medication, it's on the application, it's a, it's a suggested questions on the questionnaire um, uh, page that we ask residents, what medications are you on? So that the house can remain safe with people that are on medications. Um, and that so that the person that is on the medication is taking it as it is prescribed and that you don't get the misuse or the unuse. Unuse is also uh, neglecting your responsibility to the household. Um, I have been in four, three Oxford houses, Howard Avenue, uh, the Willow, and now Humble. I'm also a resident too. She said alumni, but I was an alumni and I'm back in the house. So anyway, um, the thing is, like I said, when you all have residents that comes in that, that is on a medication for whatever reason, our responsibility to that person is to keep an open mind um, about our thinking of what it is. If you don't know, ask. You know, that's the, simple, that's the easiest question to get answered. You have to open your mouth and ask. If you're not asking, you don't know. And what you don't know, you're afraid of. So I suggest that you keep an open mind when you get a resident that's either on a maintenance program or a person such as myself because the drugs that I take has street credibility. If I'm missing a pills or something else of that nature, and I'm in a house of uh, residents who may want to sneak through my room and take my medication and to go sell it, you know, that's not cool either. That's why we're probably talking about the lock boxes. That you bring those medications out when it needs to be administered. And until I see more hands in here that are clinicians, I'm gonna just ask you all, be open-minded and start asking questions, you know? Again, I don't have a whole lot to prepare, but we want to leave time for question and answer, so that's all I have to share with you all today. Thank you all. You didn't have to post me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we do have time for Q&A, so if, if you want to just line up, just speak directly into the microphone since this is being recorded. Okay. Um, I, I'm Bo and I'm an addict. So I was wondering about the medications as far as the pill counts that you guys suggest on doing. Are we just looking them up to do pill counts for medications that are abusable or as you kind of implied earlier with the blood pressure medications and stuff, which is what we used to do was was uh, do pill counts on all medications to make sure that they're being taken as prescribed. And then we've kind of steered away from some of that type of stuff and just do medications that are abusable as we look up and determine what's abusable, like, uh, you know, Klonopin or any type of narcotic or gabapentin or uh, Boost Bar or just different types of non-narcotic medications. Um, I think it's up to the house. I really do. I mean, like, I can give you my opinion, uh, which is that I think there's a lot of prescription medications that are just so clearly non-controversial and non-problematic that the house doesn't really have to worry about counting them. Um, but if a house was inclined to just say, hey, we're not going to worry about picking and choosing which ones we do and don't, and they want to do them all, that's the house's prerogative as well. I mean, I see it more often the case that houses just, when it's a particular kind of medication that might be problematic, they'll be counting those pills, but not other ones. All right, thank you very much. This will make sure we're doing it right. My name is Stacy, I'm an addict. If, if you have an individual who um, is on a prescription and he doesn't go fill his prescription on time, so he doesn't have to take, is that a relapse? Uh, yeah, so it would be the same thing as not, not taking your medication. Um, if he feels or he or she feels that she, they want to get off of the medication, they need to go to the doctor and they need to work that out with their doctor. But it's the same thing if it's, you know, the doctor told them to fill it three times, they need to fill it three times. If they need to take it twice daily, they need to take it twice daily. Okay. All right, and if the person is on, he has a lockbox, and he wants to keep his daily doses in his pocket. Is that appropriate? So, 
Yeah, so you said the, the person has a lockbox and he keeps the medication in there, and then when he takes his daily pills out, he puts the like, two daily in his pocket. Right. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay, okay, now another question. If um, Say if we have a voter person comes in and the person has a medication and maybe one person in the house is really uncomfortable with that and the majority votes the guy in the house, who do we look out for? The guy who's been in our house for six months is working a good program or do we look out for the guy that's coming in? You all, everyone speaks the truth and let the group conscience take hold. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, um, okay, like in the case of people on Suboxone, if you got people that, I, it, I have trouble sometimes, you know, getting into somebody's business, you know, and I don't know if it's, if it's a problem with, with money for the drugs or if it's a problem with them, you know, working and not being able to get to the place on time to get it or whatever. But some people, they get 30 in a script and some people get on a weekly basis. They have to go in on a week, you know, by the week. And if, if you see a house member, I'm not a heroin addict, so I don't, I don't know. Um, but it seems to me that, that that's the only thing standing between a person and starting to use drugs again is, is Suboxone. And, so I was wondering if a person is not doing the count, if, if they're, you know, oh, I ran out and I didn't get it today. And that's, that's happening, you know, on a semi-weekly basis. You know, do you, is that, is that like, um, do you, you know, figure the person's relapse? Um, I just have a couple thoughts and if someone wants to add something, that's fine. One. Medication-assisted recovery drugs, Suboxone, you know, Subutex, Methadone are sort of a whole big issue in and of themselves, and that's why we are going to have a whole separate uh, breakout panel at the next session talking specifically about them. The only thing I would add to that is, I mean, Oxford House has reached a point now where they are embracing the idea that medication-assisted recovery is good and it helps and it can be part of Oxford House and people can recover in Oxford House using them. I think it's helpful, and from my perspective, to make a distinction sometimes to remember that, like, those are drugs that people are taking in order to address the very problem they're living in Oxford House to get help with, right? It's about specifically their addiction. Whereas what we've really been talking about here today is the medications that people are taking for all the other kind of health issues that they have. And I think it's worthwhile in our minds to sort of think of those two as kind of separate issues. Here are the drugs that these people are here taking to deal with their addiction, and here are the drugs that like are about other things that they may be dealing with. Um, just might help guide the house, but there's a whole other session. I don't know if Sean wanted to add something. I would just say this about that, that in our house it's always been that the stuff is going to hit the fan anyway, you know? It's, you know, it's going to show up whether you're suspicious or you're not. It's going to, you know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's tall. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Um, I have a question about recording the medications. Um, like, I know he said that it's up to the house if we do, like, obviously um, non problematic medications. We don't record those in our house, per se. Um, so, my question is is the correct way of recording them? Um, so that we go back and have record of it and can hold them accountable is some people say we record them in the minutes of, of get a secretary shoot out and record it in the minutes. Some people say you make a file and you just do it on line paper. Like what's the correct way of uh, keeping record of people's medications? That's a great question. Um, I, uh, I, I was wondering that kind of same thing when I was living in a house and I was like, where's this form for it? Um, that's a lot, you know, you know, we, the pill count, the how many and how many they're supposed to take per week and da 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 da, right? Um, enough room to do so <laughs> um, because those little boxes in the secretary's minutes are a little small. So I, I created something. I'd be happy to share it with you if, you're, if you want it after this. I do. And in the absence of that, a lot of houses will just pull out the application and update that section of the application that asks for the, you know, what medications you're on. Okay, so, so if it's not recorded in the secretary minutes and each person has an individual file with line paper, is that 
gonna hold up if it were to be a problem like legally or anything? And that's my question. Like, is there a way that it would be a problem if somebody got kicked out for misuse of medication or whatever, and then they were like, well, where's the record of it? Like. Well, I mean, re really the only people that will be asking that are gonna be your chapter officers or housing services. Okay. Um, or outreach, like where is that medication? What you know, did the house do its responsibility in making sure that they were taking it as prescribed, or did they just kick them out? Okay. So it's it's really like I, CYA, like that was for me. Like I just wanted to um, make sure that everything was kind of covered. If I were to ever get asked questions, <laughs> if my houses were ever to get asked questions. Okay. I have one more question. Um, we have. A couple of residents um, in the past and currently that have, you know, they're older residents and they have a lot of medications and they are buying or, per, or going to refilling medications and but well, like when one come into the house, she combined one bottle with another already when she came in and they're non-narcotic medication, but they're, she just had combined them in the same bottle. And so it says when I recorded it, it said quantity 30, amount 68, you know, like amount on hand 68. Um, so what we had told her was that from here on out, don't combine your medications in the bottle and don't open the next bottle until this one's completely used up. Is that right? I mean, or how do you go about that when they come? I, I would say it, um, it wouldn't be okay. What I wanted to answer was the first part of your question. When you have document anything that you do on a business meeting, that's what you want to do. Keep things documented because if you don't, it never happened. Right. Now, as far as um, refilling medications, I get refills every 30 days. Right. So, and it comes before my medication runs out, so it doesn't run out. Right. So maybe that person, again, needs to be open and honest about that I got a refill, and I just refilled the bottle that the other medication was in. Okay, thank you. I just, uh, just a quick uh, matter of course, I think it's a really good idea for everybody who has medications to have a list of all the medications they're on. The medicine doesn't know whether it was given for blood pressure or for psychiatric this or that. And some of the medications I think also, uh, you know, people get used to taking medications for its immediate effect. The whole range of many of the psychiatric medications, it's a duration of effect, so you really have to let it build over time. And then for those medications, there can also be a discontinuation syndrome, which is basically a bit of a withdrawal if you stop it or it's not, you know. So at any rate, but it's, bottom line is have a list of every, everybody just for themselves should have a list of all the medications. Uh, just, uh, and, and, and then discuss it with the doctor, the pharmacist, because a lot of times <laughs> medications from different specialties are overlapping and the side effects can also be overlapping and some very significant side effects. I have a question on the uh, ADD meds that go by the name of, for example, Concerta, Vyvanse, and of course Adderall, and their prescription to, or their Schedule II controlled substances like OxyContin. So the question is, should, I know there's no blanket policy about prohibiting a specific type of med in an Oxford house, but in this case, do you, is it considerable? I mean, should a person who's a former heroin or, or cocaine addict be living in an Oxford house and taking ADD meds for uh, what his doctor considers ADD when he was uh, a former drug addict. It's kind of a question for Dr. Hoffman because there are alternative meds, for example, Stratera. That's my question. And it gets back to my initial thought of, you know, maybe part of the task sometimes around the house is to find a group of providers that you actually trust and like. Um, there's no illness that I can think of that has only one medication option. Uh, you know, fundamentally with ADD, it's a, really, if it's a focusing issue, that's a norepinephrine system type of a thing. Drugs that re inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine will have focusing effects for many people. So there is, it, it, it's, it's not a one drug must be used, but uh, some people just have their favorite medications and that's what they'll prescribe. So there's another group that will find alternatives. Therapy actually has also been effective in ADHD-like symptoms. And the other question, just for people who have had that diagnosis, has there actually been a good workup, you know, following DSM-5 criteria for the diagnosis of ADHD? I've seen people, um, you know, while they were smoking marijuana, they also couldn't focus, and then they got their Adderall to help focus while they're still smoking marijuana. 
So yes, they, oh, I can see things better now. But you know, the reality is that you really want the diagnosis also well established. And, that's, and again, the house really can't do as much other than to maybe find the providers that they would yeah. think might provide that information. That would also be the provider group that would be receptive to having people come in from an Oxford house with the permission of the patient to be part of a session. I mean, I would love to have a practice that knowing people are living in Oxford houses. All right, then uh, just a final comment. The, uh, the paper the guy from Texas talked about this, the medication memo. It only lists narcotics. It doesn't say anything about stimulants. Just a heads up on that. I think it's a loophole that people use to abuse amphetamines in Oxford houses. Thanks for letting me share. I generally uh, counsel houses to view that term in as broad of a concept as they can, because you will find definitions of narcotics that sort of are a little more expansive than just so. Hey, my name's, my name's Terry. Um, so I have a, situ, a resident who is on a narcotic and, and another, like Xanax bars. It says, you know, on one medication it says one to two daily as needed. Um, and this house is having issues with how do I med count this individual? How do I make sure he's taking his medications? My suggestion has been, like you guys said, off behaviors. Um, but it's, you know, it's their opinion that if you wake up and take a hydrocodone and a Xanax bar as prescribed, you're getting high. I'll take that one. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that we need to get really specific about the medication memo, and uh, this and goes back that, to the... What's that? He, he's gone through that proper procedure, so the house is like, they're uncomfortable with it, right? But they're being told, you know, I, they can't evict this gentleman for being on this prescribed medication, but each individual in the house is, is very uncomfortable with it. Um, well, they can. I mean, you guys can have a vote and okay. evict... Because, I mean, the, I, it's disruptive behavior. Yeah. It's affecting the house as a whole. It's, uh, you guys can vote, and if it's not conducive to recovery, okay. you guys can totally do that. And also, like, just going forward, I feel like the medication memo needs to be more specific. Like, the as needed yeah. is a really dangerous area, and we want to, like, ask that doctors don't put that because that's really counterintuitive to... Uh, being in recovery from drug addiction. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. If if I lived in that house, then I would have just went with them to the doctor's Sorry. appointment and <laughs> ask him if I can go. We have Julie. One, one more question. Oh. Good morning. I'm Carrie. I have a very dry question. Uh, there's med information, of course, on uh, members' applications and on the emergency medical form. Uh, my question is, does Oxford House Inc., um, or by extension, Oxford House is required to comply with HIPAA, and so that medical information is private, and we are, not require we are required to comply and not release that to outside parties, uh, restrict access, et cetera, et cetera? So, good question. Um, no, we are not beholden to HIPAA in any way, shape, or form. Is it whatsoever. the policy of Oxford Inc. not to release that information? Oxford Inc. doesn't have a policy on that. Okay, so any of that information can be discussed amongst outsiders without a problem. I, I mean, I... Because I, it's happened, and I want to make sure I either get upset or I just don't care. <laughs> what? No, I... Let, let, me ta let me take a stab at that. Even if, look, even if there isn't a policy, you can get upset. I mean, you know, like, again, this is sort of like sometimes Oxford House... We expect Oxford Houses to get governed by, like, common sense and empathy and like decency. So like we might have a problem with the idea that someone is going and sharing house issues outside of the house. Right. There is no legal prohibition against it, but it could still be problematic and need to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Uh, and actually where HIPAA does come into play is that in the, in the medical setting, the patient does have to sign a would have to sign a release to share or to kind of share information with whomever, but it really is a, uh, a decision made by the patient and provider whether to have you part of the discussion, for example. Hi, I'm Matt and I'm an addict. I was uh, wanting maybe some advice on a situation we had going on at our house and have ran into in the past. Do you have any advice for um, new members coming out of treatment facilities or people that have gone, had to go to the hospital that, um, 
are still dropping dirty for a certain thing they've been prescribed like four or five weeks still down the line you know at what point should we give to get it out of the system versus if they're still actively using it so uh, the Oxford house model existed for about 20 years without urine drug tests and we base things off of behavior and had conversations um, so if you, if, if you feel uncomfortable, you can share those things uh, in a house setting with, those, with that individual. Um, and, and if you, if you, just, you, know, you want to be supportive, it's the best place to be, do it as a family. Well, I guess re the reason why I ask it's been like five or six weeks and the person hasn't shown behaviors of a relapse or anything like, or misuse, but it's still in their system. So it's kind of concerning. Okay, well, number one, I think, beware of some of the urine tests because there are a lot of drugs that can come positive on, a, on, on these enzyme-type drug tests, the home drug tests. And so if it's being done in a treatment setting, number one, you can set the threshold. You know, it's, it's, you set thresholds, but you also can do confirmation tests. You know, is it really that one, or is it Wellbutrin, for example, or is it like, pros, you know, because some, Lexabroke, some of them will overlap into something that might pop positive. The one that you might be referring to, marijuana, um, that can, that's in fat stores, and that can kind of hang out there for a month, and it generally will low, if the person has stopped using, it generally should go down, but one may be looking at creatinine levels also. So what I'm saying in there is that it really, you know, that those are tests that probably should be bounced off somebody who knows about drug tests um, and, and not be the sole basis of whether they're in or out. It's a little like using the ADD checklist and say, I answered all the questions, so I must have ADD. Well, you know, that's not, you know, it, you know the drug test in the same light. You know, it, it, it's in context of other things and, and maybe best linked to somebody that actually might be using drug tests in a program, for example. Okay, thank you. I just want to say, I come from an area too that we don't use drug tests at all at all, in any way, shape, or form. We go by the model that says we are a behavior-based model, and when people come into the house, we ask the 30-day, uh, we call it probation, some states call it blackout periods, to get to know that individual, form a baseline for their behaviors, and whether they're dropping dirty or not, to be honest, I would never know, the members in the house would never know, but what we do know is the behaviors are consistent for since the day that they've moved in. Mm -hmm. So that's... We're out. And we're, and we're out of time. If you didn't get a chance, you can come up here and talk to the panelists. Thanks, guys. Three.